This is dihydrofolate reductase, otherwise known as DHFR. DHFR is a small enzyme that's found in every cell which undergoes replication. In humans, it consists of 186 amino acid residues, has a molecular weight of only 20 kilodaltons, and contains 8 beta strands and 4 alpha helices. Dihydrofolate reductase binds to two biological substrates. Not surprisingly, one of these substrates is dihydrofolate. The other substrate DHFR binds is NADPH. You can think of DHFR like a little biological recycling bin. It takes a molecule that's produced during biological processes that the cells don't want and recycles it into a usable molecule. Specifically, DHFR takes dihydrofolate produced during DNA synthesis pathways and recycles it into tetrahydrofolate. There are several biological pathways that produce dihydrofolate as a byproduct. However, the one you're about to see is one of the most important. This is the thymidylate synthase pathway, which converts deoxyuridine monophosphate, or DUMP, into deoxythymidine monophosphate, or DTMP. DTMP is an essential component of DNA synthesis. This pathway requires the oxidation of methylene tetrahydrofolate into dihydrofolate, and that methylene tetrahydrofolate comes from regular old tetrahydrofolate. If the reaction shown here were to continue on into infinity, then eventually you'd have a buildup of dihydrofolate and a depletion of tetrahydrofolate. That would stop this pathway from proceeding, inhibiting DNA synthesis completely and inducing cell death. So how do we replenish our tetrahydrofolate? The answer, of course, is DHFR. As we already know, DHFR recycles dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. In fact, this protein is the only source of tetrahydrofolate in cells. DHFR couples its reduction reaction with an oxidation, the conversion of NADPH to NADP+. So how does DHFR catalyze this reaction? Let's start with the basics. In this reaction, a double bond between a nitrogen and carbon atom in the dihydrofolate is reduced by a proton in NADPH. The reduction across this double bond results in the addition of two protons on either side of the bond. You may have noticed that NADPH only donates one hydrogen to dihydrofolate, yet there are two additional protons in tetrahydrofolate. The second proton is donated by the aqueous environment surrounding DHFR. Dihydrofolate and NADPH bind to DHFR at its active site, which is shaped like a long groove that runs through the protein. The active site is located in between DHFR's two subdomains, the adenosine binding subdomain and the loop subdomain. The adenosine binding subdomain binds and stabilizes the adenosine ring within NADPH. The loop subdomain contains three short sequences of the amino acid residues called loops. The MET20 loop, the FG loop, and the GH loop. The MET20 loop contains the 9th through 24th residues in DHFR. This loop of amino acids is essential for stabilizing the nicotinamide ring in NADH. If you recall, the nicotinamide ring contains the protons which will be donated to reduce dihydrofolate, so stabilizing this ring is crucial for DHFR's catalytic activity. The MET20 loop is very flexible and can take on three conformations, called open, closed, and occluded. In its open conformation, the MET20 loop faces away from DHFR's active site, allowing NADPH and dihydrofolate to bind there. Once the two substrates bind, the MET20 loop changes to its closed conformation. This allows the residues in the loop to form favorable interactions with NADPH's nicotinamide ring, catalyzing the transfer of a proton from NADPH to dihydrofolate. Here's a look at how some of the residues in the MET20 loop's closed conformation interact with the atoms in or around the nicotinamide ring. In this image, you can see the amino acids in the MET20 loop forming favorable interactions with these atoms. The pink dashed lines represent hydrogen bonding, while the green dashed line shows a hydrophobic interaction. This closed conformation holds the NADPH and dihydrofolate in close proximity to one another, facilitating the transfer of a proton from this carbon on NADPH to this carbon on dihydrofolate. After that proton transfer converts dihydrofolate into tetrahydrofolate, the MET20 loop changes conformation once again to its occluded position. In the occluded conformation, the MET20 loop changes its position so that it moves into the portion of the active site where the nicotinamide ring binds, causing steric hindrance. This high energy conformation causes DHFR to release the newly formed tetrahydrofolate. We've already discussed that dihydrofolate reductase is essential for the pathways involved in DNA synthesis, since it's every cell's only source of tetrahydrofolate. If the mechanism of DHFR were inhibited in humans, 
we'd be unable to produce tetrahydrofolate, which would stop our DNA synthesis pathways and therefore stop a cell division. For this reason, DHFR has great clinical significance. Because cancer cells rise more rapidly than most healthy cells in the human body, inhibiting the catalytic action of DHFR can prevent them from replicating, therefore killing cancerous cells. The first physician to put this knowledge to use was Dr. Sidney Farber, the inventor of modern chemotherapy. Back in 1947, Dr. Farber used a drug called aminopterin to treat children with leukemia. Though aminopterin was a successful chemotherapy drug, it was eventually replaced with a similar molecule called methotrexate, which is still used as a cancer treatment drug today. Methotrexate acts as a competitive inhibitor to dihydrofolate reductase. Its affinity for binding to DHFR is 1,000-fold to that of dihydrofolate. So when methotrexate is present in a cell, it will bind to DHFR's active site instead of dihydrofolate. The reason methotrexate has a greater binding affinity than dihydrofolate is actually pretty interesting. As you can see, the two molecules have fairly similar molecular structures. However, there's one difference in particular that accounts for their different binding affinities. It's this. Where dihydrofolate has a double bonded oxygen on its fused rings, methotrexate has an amine group. Let's see how this plays out in binding to DHFR. You can see here that these two amine groups in dihydrofolate form hydrogen bonds with the aspartate 27 residue. This helps dihydrofolate bind to the active site. Now let's look at methotrexate. Methotrexate also forms two hydrogen bonds to aspartate 27, although to two different amine groups. Additionally, where dihydrofolate had a double bonded oxygen atom, methotrexate has another amine group. This group can form even more hydrogen bonds with two nearby isoleucines and one tyrosine residue. This increased number of hydrogen bonds makes the binding of methotrexate to DHFR's active site much stronger and more stable than the binding of dihydrofolate. Interestingly, this causes methotrexate to bind in a different orientation than dihydrofolate. You can see this if you look at the placement of the aspartate 27 residues in relation to the fused rings, as well as the direction the rest of each molecule points. And that's how methotrexate inhibits the mechanism of DHFR and kills cancer cells. Though dihydrofolate reductase isn't a direct component of DNA synthesis pathways, it's necessary for the replication of any cell and will always be remembered as the target of the first ever chemotherapy drug. <laughs>